Okay. Okay. Good evening. This is a call of the Wilmette Public Library Board of Trustees meeting to order for January 19th at 6.01 p.m. The notices have been distributed via the uh, vehicles that were in your agenda. And Trustee Barshish, can we have the roll call? Certainly can. <clears throat> Trustee Barshish, here. Trustee Fishman. Joan? I'm muting. Here. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't Sorry. looking that way. Trustee Johnson? Not yet. Trustee Riddle? Here. Trustee Rogers? Here. Trustee Wolf? Here. Good. And Trustee McDonald? Here. And uh, Anthony, do you want to talk? Uh, we have several observers. Yes, I do. I see a number of staff and some mm -hmm. observers from the uh, League of Women Voters will met. So mm -hmm. um, from the staff, I'm seeing Marty Belfontaine, John Risco, um, Jill McEwen, Kim Hagland, Re <clears throat> Rebecca Vranenakwin, Alice Joseph, Patsy Devono, and we also have our three observers. Um, I see Liz Seeger and Tracy Summer and Patricia Nealon. Welcome, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. At this time, it's the time for public comment. And anyone who would wish to address the Board of Trustees, this is your time to do so. Is there anyone that would like to address the Board of Trustees at this time? Okay, going once, twice. Moving right along. Behind um, tab number three, you've got the review of the draft of the minutes from November 17, 2020. Is there a motion to adopt the minutes? I will motion to do so. Is I'll second. Okay. It's been moved by Trustee Wolf and seconded by Trustee Barshis to move and second the minutes from November 17, 2020. Is there any discussion or corrections at this point in time? Being none, can we have a roll call to approve the minutes? For sure. Trustees? Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Not here. Trustee Riddle? Here. Trustee Rogers? Here. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. At this time, there are no presentations, so we will move to the treasurer's report. Trustee Rogers will be going over the financial reports for November, December, as well as the bills and salaries. Trustee Rogers. Okay. Um, November and December are generally low revenue months in terms of tax receipts. Uh, we received just over $15,000 in real estate taxes and 24, almost $24,000 in interest um, in November and December's combined statements, um, and about $3,400 in uh, personal property tax proceeds. So um, those are low revenue numbers, low, low revenue months. Um, we are at 50% of our, I'm sorry, the, um, we're 46% of the budget uh, for the first six months uh, through the end of December. Uh, there's nothing extraordinary in, um, in our uh, checks. The two items that I'm going to move on separately is to approve first the November 2020 bills and salaries, which you have as an attachment in your materials. Uh, so I move that we approve the November 2020 bills and salaries. I'll second. Are there any questions about um, November detail? Trustee Rogers has moved. Trustee Wolf has seconded the approval of the November bills and salaries. Can we have a roll call vote? Trustee mm -hmm. Trustee Barshus, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson, absent. Trustee Riddle? 
Yes. No. She, she held her hand up. Say yes. Hi. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> I can now. Thanks. Um, Trustee Rogers. Yes. Trustee Wolf. Yes. And Trustee McDonald. Yes. Hey, I also will move approval of the December 2020 bills and salaries, which you also have as an attachment in the minutes. Is there a second? I'll right. second that motion. Okay, Trustee Rogers has moved the approval of the bills and salaries for December 2020, and Trustee Wolf has seconded. Is there any discussion or questions at this time? I have a question. I noticed that this was, um, I think, the third, it might be the third month, the third consecutive report that we're hearing about the um, the building supplies expense and it being higher than usual due to the, to the you know, related COVID, I'm sure PE, P PPE equipment. I was wondering if we needed to kind of revisit this line and I mean, I'm sure this is going to be somewhat, would you consider this to be kind of a, a usual expense that we're going to have over the next you know, year, 12 months or so? I, th I think what I would say, oh goodness, sorry about that feedback. Um, I think what I would say about this um, expense is that we are doing our best to try to acquire PPE as it becomes available. Early in the pandemic, it was a challenge to find supplies. And so as our vendors have been able to provide us with the equipment, um, we've been ordering in advance in the event that there would be um, you know, a shortage of those supplies somewhere down the road. So at this point, I think we have a substantial um, amount to get us through. And um, I, you know, we'll, we'll continue to purchase it as needed, but I think we have enough of the stores here presently. So I don't think that this is, I mean, I'm obviously monitoring this line. Um, I don't think that we're gonna nose up on um, spending that, that down completely. Um, uh, we have a couple other lines that are adjacent to it that if we needed to, um, we'd be able to fall into. So if you if you look at the progress on some of the other building lines, um, some of those may be able to help us out with supporting some of those expenses. But um, this one doesn't concern me at this time. I don't think we need to make an amendment to the budget for that line. But Good to I know. It. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for the explanation. And by no means am I saying, you know, we're, uh, you know, kind of under uh, or oversupplied. Uh, I, I appreciate the background. Um, you're muted, Lisa. The back P. It's been moved by Trustee Rogers and seconded by Trustee Wolf to approve the December bills and salaries. Can we have a roll call, Trustee Barshis? Mm -hmm. Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson, absent. Trustee Riddle? Aye. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes, the motion passed six, six to zero. Having there being there are no action items, we will move to the discussion and with Director Austin reviewing the updated pandemic response plan. Thank you. Okay. Um, I hope y'all are prepared because I've got a lot to talk about tonight. Um, <laughs> so you're going to get to hear me a, a fair bit. So first of all, I want to make sure, can everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. okay, yes. okay. All right. So um, you may recall that the last time that we got together as a board, we were coming together to talk about our plans for potentially closing the library. And in fact, we needed to make a hard pivot to close the library last November in um, the days immediately preceding the board meeting due to the fact that there was a rise in uh, the COVID metrics for our region, but also due to the fact that we had um, our first positive case on staff um, for staff inside the library. So there were a number of steps that we needed to take at that time when we made that pivot. As we're meeting here this evening, we are um, also, we're kind of on the other side of that now. Um, yesterday, the governor made an announcement that moved region 10, which is suburban Cook County into tier two, um, which means that um, we would meet the criteria that we would need in order to reopen the library. So there's gonna be a number of things that we'll talk about related to this here in a moment. And I'm also gonna soon introduce you to our circulation manager, Kim Hegland, who is joining mm -hmm. us on the call here tonight. And she's gonna talk about what our current service model is and the steps that we're taking going forward with relation to the circulation department. 
I want to give you a little bit more context before we get into that conversation um, to talk a little bit about the planning that we're making in order to reopen the building. Um, this is not a topic that we take lightly, and it's been a topic of a lot of discussion here on the library today. So, um, as you know, um, the metrics that we've been discussing um, have been satisfied. Um, the governor has indicated that um, locally um, the, the transmission rate of COVID or the positive tests um, are certainly below 10% and locally they're at about 5%. So um, that is good performance for our community. Um, that shows that the measures that we're taking um, are effective. And um, the ICU bed count is um, back where it should be um, at uh, about 20%. So with those criteria met, um, we can seriously consider what it would take in order to open the library. Um, that said, we're also learning right now that there are new variants of the coronavirus that are making their way through um, this part of the country. And um, they're coming from all around the world. And apparently the transmission rate with these are 50% uh, greater than that of what we're seeing um, with the current virus that we've been battling uh, to this date. So that certainly gives us some concern as we think about um, where we need to be. So the leadership team and I have been evaluating, as I said, some necessary steps that we need to take in the building in order for, to prepare the building for reopening. There are some building factors that we need to take, that we need to uh, satisfy first. Um, one of those steps is the relocation of our holds. Um, for the first time in almost a year, um, when we reopen the library, we are planning to resume open holds, which means patrons will be able to come into the library as they were, say, back in February of 2020, and they can pick their own books off the shelf uh, that have been set aside for them on hold. Um, CCS, as, a, um, as our, our vendor, uh, is expecting us to do um, a new procedure for, for Wilmette Library, although we are one of the last in, in CCS to do this. Um, for how we wrap our books um, in order to preserve patron identity. So we're, we're taking um, this precaution in order to protect patron privacy as we're putting these materials out on the shelves. Now we currently have more holds on the shelves than we have in the past. And that's because our service model has been oriented towards parking lot pickup. I'm gonna try not to steal too much of Kim's thunder here because I'm sure she has a lot to say about that. Um, but we need to allocate more shelving space than we have in the past. You may remember when you first walked in the library, um, immediately to your left by the circulation desk, you would see some shelves and that's where you would pick up your holds. Well, currently we're taking up maybe four or five times as many shelves as we had there previously. So we need to find a new location for those. In order to find a new location, um, I, I, we're kind of explaining this as like one of those little flat puzzles that has an open square and then you have to move all the pieces around to make the puzzle. That's where we're at. Uh, the open square is the, is the piece that we're looking for. And some things have had to move around the library as a result. I'll get into that in a little bit here, but we're shifting a lot of collections and we're preparing the building in a way that we have not quite done to date. So there are some things that we need to do with the building before we reopen it. Um, so um, basically what I'm saying at this point is that we are on track to open um, no earlier than February 1 at this point. We're going to need at least 10 days in order to do some of this work that we're preparing for. But there's also a number of other criteria that we need to look at too. But to zoom out and to look at library land um, to kind of see what our peers are doing, um, you'll see that um, we're not the first to reopen and we're certainly not going to be the last. Um, Evanston Library is currently open. Glenview Library opened yesterday. Uh, Glencoe Library is planning to reopen on Monday the 25th. A few of our, our neighboring libraries up the shore are looking into February. Um, February 8th, I think, is what they're targeting um, in Highland Park and Lake Forest. There's even talks of, um, of much later, like pushing back into March, even though we're into um, Tier 2 now. Uh, the Vernon Area Library never opened after it closed um, a year ago. And Chicago Public has been basically open throughout the whole process. So there's no one size fits all. Each organization and community has their own criteria. And because our buildings are a big part of all of this, the way that buildings are designed has a lot to do with the influence of whether the library is prepared to reopen to the community or not. Drive up windows being one of those factors too. But as I said before, um, while we think we may be able to meet this February 1 date, this time around, it's a little bit different because there are other variables. Staff has been um, speaking with me a fair bit today with some of their concerns. 
And I wanted to share those concerns with you as this is criteria that I think we need to consider as we're making this decision for our community. So overall, staff have concerns that our current safety guidelines may not be enough to protect staff from the new strain and a request to wait until health officials know more about what additional precautions may be necessary. As I said before, there's this new strain that has a 50% greater transmissibility, and we don't know much about it right now. Uh, one request from staff was that we would provide very specific kinds of masks um, and that um, we need to make sure that we're getting them from an authentic source because a lot of the ones that are available elsewhere are counterfeit and may not actually be effective at containing the virus. There have been requests from staff to wait until the opportunity has at least um, passed for, for staff, particularly those over 65 have been partially vaccinated. Um, the village has, a, has approached um, uh, the county with a request to include all units of local government. Um, I'm really impressed with the steps that Mike Brayman has taken on behalf of all units of local government in an effort to try to get libraries and parks as well as the schools and village officials um, classified in the 1B or 1C category for the distribution of the vaccination. I currently don't have any information about the availability of the vaccine right now, um, but I do think that that is still some emerging information that may give some folks a bit more comfort as we adapt to this new normal. Um, ILA and Rails have also taken to advocating and have been circulating documentation to help libraries make their own advocacy to their local counties. And Wilmette Library has used that template in an effort to try to get listed a little bit earlier for our staff to get the vaccine. So we're trying to hit that from a number of angles, but the vaccine I think is a factor. Um, there are still concerns from staff about the compliance that our patrons have with our guidelines. Um, even during the summer months, we found that not everyone was, was you know, knowing how to wear their mask. And even, even through November, we had a lot of saggy masks and a lot of exposed noses and stuff like that. So as we're being told right now that we need to be using more of the N95 type masks or starting to wear uh, filters and eliminate the use of the cloth masks, there is the concern that the public being in the building may not be able to use them, uh, the masks appropriately. And there's also been some concern about this being um, the cold and flu season anyway, and that our staffing levels might not be able to sustain this. Um, there's also concerns from a few staff who are older and fall into that category, who are concerned about an, a, uh, a reasonable accommodation for their work environment, which may mean that we may be a bit more stressed as we're trying to work in teams to keep everyone healthy and safe. We may not actually have the adequate staffing that we need in order to, to sustain operations as we've designed it. Um, there's also concerns about where we're at locally in terms of the cases, and I've shared those tools with staff so that they know what metrics we're looking at. And as, as, I, as I said earlier, um, locally, we seem to be doing better than other parts of suburban Cook County, so I feel a bit more comfort in that regard. Um, but basically, given all the information that I've shared with you here this evening, I'm curious to hear where the board feels uh, this evening based upon what the governor's announcement was yesterday and our efforts to uh, ramp up to reopening um, as early as February 1, but also in light of everything else that I've said here, um, where would you have us um, consider reopening the building for browsing? Knowing that um, when we reopen the building, we're effectively going to be offering the same services that we did uh, last summer and fall, which is essentially the main difference between um, what we're offering currently via parking lot pickup is that you would be able to come in and browse the stacks. You'd be able to use computers for up to one hour. However, there are no in-person programming. There is no um, uh, study rooms, uh, no meeting room availability for lease. And um, the capacity limit of the building is at 50 and that we are asking all patrons to limit their time in the building to one hour. All right, trustees, what do you think? I would suggest that as a first step, um, we should not reopen the building until we have better information about the availability of vaccines, particularly to uh, any staff who meet the next uh, grouping uh, requirements of over 65. Uh, if the request uh, from the village to include uh, all of our staff in that, uh, in that grouping works, then you're mainly dependent on the availability of, of vaccines. That may change significantly in the next four weeks. 
Um, we don't know how all of that is going to play out. Uh, and so, and, and what, 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 the only thing we know for sure is that the level of information that has been shared publicly about the availability of vaccines is incomplete. We don't know what's been left out. We don't know what the actual supplies are. And until some clarity is available to let us know exactly where that stands, I think it's premature to, to expose staff to risks that we don't have any way of measuring. Um, and so I would suggest that February 1 is probably too soon. Uh, if everything fell in place perfectly, mid-February might be a feasible reopening time. Uh, but if it moved, uh, if we didn't reopen in February, it's not catastrophic. Um, the issue, quite frankly, is that um, uh, we're maintaining a level of service that meets what we can safely deliver until we have a clearer picture of vaccination availability. And I think it's important to protect staff and other patrons uh, until we have enough information to have a better sense of what's happening there. Uh, I'm much less concerned about the variant than I am about the availability of vaccines to protect staff and patrons um, under these circumstances. Anthony, I just have a question. There is no way to uh, demand that staff take the vaccine when it becomes available, is that correct? That is correct, a vaccine is elective. And given that it's elective, and I think in terms of the, and I sort of differ from uh, Trustee Rogers in thinking that it's given the measures that you've put in place that there is never gonna be any certainty as to when the vaccines are gonna be available. And then when they do become available, you've got to get two doses, which means it's probably a three to four week when you get up to 90%, if that's in case true, because I think with the first vaccine, it's only 50%. I think in terms of, there are no guarantees, whether it's cold or flu season. So I would open the uh, library February 1st with those precautions that you are stating. I think there needs to be some way to enforce that the uh, patrons wear masks. And then perhaps with the uh, staff, they probably need to double mask with a cloth and then put the N95, because that's what I was told when I go visit my mother in the memory care by uh, social workers so that I don't catch it. But those are just my thoughts in terms of, because you've got 50%, they're in and out in an hour, there's no place to sit except in the uh, computer room. And then you've got the shields there to keep them from getting it. Is there any concern that the books that they touch or the videos may spread it? We're still quarantining all of our materials for three full days before check-in. So that, that process will continue. But I, what I meant is if they touch it, is there any concern? When people browse, they touch the books. There's no way to quarantine those. That wasn't a concern as much before. Is there any new information for that to be a concern now? Uh, there's no no new information about that, but that is still still a distinct possibility. Okay. Um, Other trustees? Thoughts? Yeah, I'd like to uh, just say that I would really be happy if the staff were comfortable, and I would wait until that moment, I think, before opening up. And I know that's a, that's a gradation. Some are more comfortable with some things and others are not. But I think it's not worth doing since most of the things that people do in the library, they can do with the parking lot pickup or at least the major part of it. So there isn't really an absolute necessity for people to come through the library until everyone feels as comfortable as possible with the situation. And we know from what happened uh, before the library closed and people were coming in and out, uh, as you've pointed out, that lots of people didn't have the mask and they didn't have it on correct. And they were cranky when uh, they were told that they needed to. Uh, and there are enough cranky people out there who are not following any kind of rules at all. 
that and they don't want to go to the library and be told again that they need to, to follow the rules. So we're still in the process, I think, of A, making the staff feel as comfortable as absolutely possible, and B, uh, somehow when the library opens, of making sure that whatever is required of people coming into the library is done in a safe way to the people who work at the library. So it's, and that's not easy. If I may say, um, I think it's important to have a real, um, I, I, I have, I've experienced this through some of my um, work at my local church, and I think it's important to have a real um, good conversation with those who feel anxious in, uh, on staff level. And maybe you've already maybe you've already done that, but what is it that they are anxious about? And you know, I think that we have a risk exposure locally that is still pretty low. Um, yes, there's a variant, um, but the exposure in the area is not, uh, we're, you know, the North Shore isn't the super spreaders here. Um, and we have, and folks have exposure in much more public areas than the library, the grocery store, Costco. Um, and so I think we really need to talk about what it is, or maybe they already can tell you what it is that they're uncomfortable with. I, I fear that we may, by, by waiting until uh, a vaccination is available or everybody's maybe more comfortable, um, I fear that we're losing a little bit of, or missing the needs of younger families. Um, there is some spontaneity in getting to I'll visit, to visit the library during the day um, with younger kids that aren't in school. Um, and that's hard in making an, making an appointment to pick up sometimes. I've missed mine many times and I have to wait, you know, additional, an additional time for my next appointment. So I'm, I'm just saying, I think that we might be kind of, I, I appreciate and I have parents also that I'm very cautious for. I'm living my life cautiously for my parents. And I appreciate that we have folks that are, um, you know, in, in, in the category of being, in, you know, immune compromised and, and vulnerable. But I really think we, you have the, you have the guidance and guidelines in place at the library to, to really minimize patron exposure and we miss the library. Young families miss the library. Um, if we were to wait, I would really want to know like, like why, you know, why are, why are we waiting for, is it because of a strong group of, of people that, I mean, a, a group of people that have just a strong opinion about it or is it really kind of a wider felt sentiment among the staff? I have a question um, somehow I missed. Is it still the, the uh, minimum or rather the maximum of 50 patrons in the, in the library at one time? Okay. Would there be some on uh, this point, could, you know, and along that think be some of uh, lowering, would that minimize, you know, stay risk? If the number of people on time is even doable or make any difference, but uh, I don't know if that would uh, help. We've certainly the looked at there's that, little or no. Need. Yeah, sorry, uh, you're you're breaking up a little bit. I don't. Uh, maybe your your connection's a little weak. Um, I, I did. I'm I, having a bad a bad connection day. I think it's on my end. Um, <laughs> Maybe should I go into try my chin? Or, or just even turn off your video. Turn off your video, Joan, and that might give you. Then you just have the audio um, signal versus the video signal. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Is that better? It is. Yeah. It is. Um, um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
So yeah, Thank I mean, you. I can I can speak to your point, Joan. I mean, um, could we lower the capacity of the library? Um, we could. Um, we we didn't really get to the fifty last fall. I mean, there were a few times where we got pretty close. Um, and essentially, what happens is then we have people waiting outside. And right. in winter months, it's maybe you know less desirable to set up a scenario like that. Um, and I, I think we're probably going to get some pushback from folks who are going to say, look, that's a big building, you know, let us come in, um, let us just stand in the vestibule. Well, that's certainly not a safe place for us to congregate either. There's a lot of congestion with the, the way the building is laid out. So I think the capacity is pretty much where I would leave it. I don't know if it's so much of that. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know that okay. that's going to necessarily be the same. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So you all just make a wonderful thing. Oh. I was just going to um, also just piggyback on that idea. Would appointments, in-person appointments, make a difference for the staff um, that can really control, you know, numbers and, and, and stuff? So in-person in browsing appointments for a family like, you know, like myself or something, mm -hmm. you know? That was certainly part of, you know, appointment-based browsing was certainly a model that was considered early on. And there were some of our peer libraries had experienced that as well. Um, you know, to, to your point earlier, Fina, I mean, uh, appointments don't always work for everyone and, and, and life situations can change and, and make it hard for us to sustain appointments. So um, I think, you know, it's working for the parking lot model uh, on a reasonable basis, but I'm not confident that that would be the, the model or expectation that our public would have of an open building. I think that would be a harder model for us to sustain um, and, tr and to try to manage. Um, it's, it's a lot to try to coordinate this effort right now for parking mm -hmm. lot pickup, let alone to try to coordinate that for everyone coming into the building. So I would, I would like to maybe keep that way on the back burner. Anthony, um, obviously, as we've, I've, I've been very um, appreciative of all the different opinions that the trustees have shared, and as you as well, obviously. Um, and yes, and I agree with the other trustees to say the most important thing is what we do to keep um, our staff safe and our patrons safe. Um, and yeah, just like you described before, the puzzle of trying to move that little piece around to accommodate everything, it's like, it, this is like trying to put a, a round peg in a square hole. Um, is there any way, if you analyze the possibility of doing some kind of a hybrid, um, I know certain grocery stores have senior shopping like the first hour of the morning. Um, I, I was thinking, could we possibly cut the hours in half that the library is actually open, physically open, and then you'd have an hour or two that are available for you know f young families like Fina mentioned, or you know, because I, I also know there are people of all different ages and demographics that are you know interested in getting back into the library, but also understanding we have to keep that safety uh, first and foremost. Um, so my question is. we might even have more people pile in for time frame. Um, but again, if there's a way to segment out the day, does that accommodate what, what Trustee Riddle talked about and at the same time keep the library and, and patrons safe? Yeah. Yeah, is there a way that that's manageable? Or is that just, is that more complicated? Than, yeah. it, I would say it's definitely more complicated. Um, we had toyed with that notion as well of, of having um, early hours of browsing for our most vulnerable patrons. And I know that some of our, our neighboring libraries are, are doing that. Um, I, I, I can't, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me to quote our demographics, but we have a little bit of an inverted bell um, in terms of our community demographics. So the, the two groups you're describing, I think pretty closely match what our community is right now. Um, so I don't know that it would necessarily work in, in this environment. You know, but I think if we were to do something like that, it would take a lot of coordination and planning. And I don't know that I could pull the trigger on that one as soon as February one and get together a saleable plan that would and a communication plan uh, for the community um, in, in advance uh, to meet that February one deadline. Um, but it's certainly something that we could consider if that if that were the will of the board and um, to try to move this forward. But I think we could certainly move forward with February one. Um, you know, if that if that is if that's what you all are, uh, would like to support, um, we can also go on a tentative basis. There, there are a lot of ways that we can approach this. Um, I know I'm not making this easy for you for you to consider, but no, it, 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 Trustee, it's, it's important to discuss. Yeah. And, okay, so can I make one follow up? Uh, um, uh, Trustee yeah. Riddle had asked the question: Is there any sense from you um, what the staff consensus is in terms of what they would feel is most comfortable? 
you know, and, and again, when I was thinking of the hybrid opening, you know, if there are certain staff that are comfortable with, with dealing with patrons, they could be there during the open hours and then other staff could be there in the hours where the library closed, which I know is probably even more complicated, but just in general, what kind of consensus do you get a sense of, or do you have of, of the staff and yourself? Yeah, I mean, for me, Feb February 1 feels it feels doable. I think I think we're driving an aggressive deadline to hit that, and I think that we could realistically hit that deadline. Um, we got a lot of communications to roll out, and we've got as we're about to talk about a lot of other things that are in motion right now. And I want to give some more context to this conversation as well that I think is going to be helpful. So I might ask you to kind of consider this as we as we get to Kim here, because I want Kim to talk a little bit about what we're doing currently. Um, I also want to want to just kind of move forward for one second and mention um, in my circulation statistics report for you, which you don't have the benefit of the of the longitudinal um, study. We are up actually in circulation um, for the first time um, in this pandemic year. Um, our November and December statistics were up 2% over 2019. So um, it's not for lack of our library meeting demand. In fact, I think we are quite rather exceeding demand um, in terms of our, our, able to, our ability to fulfill um, what patrons are looking for. Um, part of that is due in part to our interlibrary loan services meeting demand. Um, our, our hold system seems to be working well and the appointment based by and large is working really well for most folks. Um, so I, I don't think that we're falling down in terms of the services that we're offering. It's really just scaling this up. In terms of the concerns of, that staff have, um, I think all of those are legitimate concerns and they're not so much oriented towards the individual. I think we're trying to, we're, we're thinking as a community. So, you know, as when we, when you talk about the concerns of the staff, it isn't a selfish concern. Like I'm looking out for my own individual health, although that's a very real thing. Um, we are looking out to try to preserve the health of our community. Um, so I, I think if, if it's okay with you, I, I would like to kind of pause this conversation, give you guys a chance to think about this a little bit more. And then um, I'd like to, I'd like to introduce Kim. Um, and, and give her an opportunity to tell us a little bit about what we are doing, talk a little bit about our successes and how we're planning to move forward with the next pieces of our operation. Um, so Kim has joined us. Um, she's been with us for just three months now and a, a very busy three months it has been. So um, Kim Heglin, Circulation Manager, take it away. Good evening, everyone. Is, are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Just wanted to confirm. Um, my name is Kim Hegland. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to allow me to speak to the board this evening. Um, I, as Anthony mentioned, I've been here three months. I've been in libraries just five years. I started as the assistant circulation manager at the Evanston Public Library. So just a hop, skip and a jump um, over. Um, I am currently in library school, so I'm trying to get my master's in library science. I'm very excited about that. And a little bit of just background about myself. Um, I was a retail store manager, so I have the knowledge of customer service, being able to see and implement things and multitask. So those are what we're doing right now so efficiently with such a um, smaller staff on it is amazing what this library does. And I'm very excited to be here and during this time. It was hard to transfer during a pandemic, but this I've loved every minute of me working with the staff and the leadership team. It is such a welcoming both community and mm -hmm. every individual who works here. So I'm so happy to be here and speak. Um, I'm gonna kind of just lay out my conversation with you. So please feel free to ask questions. Um, those who haven't done parking lot pickup or have questions about um, new methods that we're looking at or what our peers are doing, please let me know. Um, so basically our current service model is we take during the week 163 parking lot pickup appointments. That does not include if you are picking up for multiple people in your household, if you have a significant other or children. So those are appointments that we are making on a daily basis. We've also included multiple pickups for both our teen kits for right now they're doing bath bombs as well as our styrofoam kids programs that we have. So those are all appointments that patrons are able to make for pickup. Um, we bag everything the day before. So we're pulling the lists. We're, 
roughly about 36 hours booked in advance. So today around about two o'clock, we still had appointments for tomorrow. So we're, we're starting to get to the point where we didn't feel at the end of December, January, if you were trying to make an appointment because of the closures, we are now at the point where you can still get an appointment the next day. So those are still um, available to you. Um, our staff is currently still making library cards. We get the applications online and verify information to our patrons. So we contact them and we'll either give them the ability to just use an e-card or we can mail the card to them and they can start to place holds immediately and do parking lot pickup when they receive their notifications. Um, we check out and pull daily quite a few holds. Yesterday, we, we emailed, called 989 patrons to pick up holds. So the ILL department is hopping. They're amazing. Today, when I left the pick list, which is all the patron requests from the whole entire consortium, was roughly under 100. So we are almost at a 24 hour turnaround because a patron can place a hold at one o'clock and we might pick it at five o'clock. So we're doing efficient work daily and we're trying to do our best when we see those holds come onto our shelves. If a patron has an appointment that day, we're looking to bag those immediately too. Um, that's our basic parking lot pickup. Right now we're looking if it is decided we will be opening um, anytime in the near future. We will be going to open holds. And as Anthony mentioned, um, the open holds will be in our new arrivals area and patrons will be able to take their books immediately, take it to the self checkout or to the staff member to, to check out. Or if they have children would like to go up to the children's department, they can use um, the self checkouts up there. So open holds, I, uh, Evanston had not changed to open holds when they reopened in July. So I ended up um, spearheading that program and educating the patrons on how to find their holds because for privacy reasons, we cannot leave the whole name more than four letters of your last name. So my hold would say H-E-G-E, K, and then my middle initial M on the hold wrapper. Um, we will have communication out to patrons on how to read it. So that way, if someone happens to have a common name, that middle name is very identifiable, as well as the last four digits of your library card will be on the hold. So we'll have a staff member um, in the open holds area directing people how to grab their holds, because this will be new. It no longer has their full last name, so Hegeland would not be there. Um, it also prevents a patron from kind of browsing the hold shelf because the books will be, you won't be able to see exactly what the book is. It'll be the stomach of the book that you'll see. Um, it's been effective at many libraries across the consortium. Um, I have spoken with my peers to see how they're doing as well as experiencing it in another library. Once patrons get an idea of how the open holds work, it, it's seamless. They grab, they know what they need to do and they typically will be in and out with the self checkouts that we have or with a staff member. Um, I know in the director report, it kind of expressed um, how many people we're running with. We usually schedule between five to eight people a day. So those five to eight people are doing parking lot pickup, the pick list, checking in materials for patrons that return, as well as answering the phone calls and making bags the next day. So. Um, there is not a wasted moment in the circulation department. We have other departments helping us pull books for patrons. Um, our book bundles have been very successful. Um, Adult Services, uh, Jill's department did a cookbook during December and that was amazing. We saw those come flying. Uh, Andrea, I know I don't see her on the call, but the children's department, department also did a let me shop the books for you, book bundles. And those were very successful. Those came down daily to the department. And it was great to see the kids and see what the uh, staff picked out for those patrons. So our hold level, we had 12,000 and some change placed over the month of December, um, which is an increase from November. 
our patrons are a reading community and we're fulfilling their needs. As Anthony mentioned, statistics are still up and we're still able to keep up with our consortium and the demand from our other libraries. Um, I'm here for, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them or whatever, uh, if I wasn't clear on a specific point. Jim, welcome. Yes. And one question, I know that sometimes there are complaints among the patrons that they've got to wait 36 hours or 24. What have been some ways that you have sort of calmed them down in terms of set their expectations and any regarding communication, just to sort of let them know what the service level is and the reason for why it takes 36 hours or 24? Yes, thank you for that question. So I think um, one of the things that's not understood is what all encompasses circulation. Um, they see the staff behind the glass and there's happens to just be two people. Um, those staff members are pulling and shelving all of the holds that come up. Um, they have two people in the basement checking in over 1400 pieces of material every day and transferring them or getting them up to Patsy in the shelving department so that they can get back on the shelf. I have one person answering the phone calls and I have two people pulling all the requests for patrons. I think when we explain how many people can actually be in the department and we have to be socially distanced. Um, I do, it may not necessarily be there, but in November when we did close for a staff member testing positive, it was in the circulation department. So the staff is very cautious of how practicing social distance, six feet, um, making sure that everyone is comfortable and setting and we have set up boundaries with each other where we're comfortable because we don't want to go through what we did in November again. So um, we're, that would be the main thing that I tell patrons. One, we're social distancing. We run between five to seven people. And I understand your concern. Is there anything else that I can transfer you to another department? So in case you want more materials, they can pull some for you. So you don't have to wait that additional time. I think those are the key things that once a patron understands what all we do, they kind of step back a little bit. Uh, there were two individuals that did end up getting kicked up to me who were concerned about not being able to get um, you know, their material the same day that they had placed a request. And for those individuals, um, I did offer to personally deliver those items to them. And um, upon learning that I would be willing to offer that service to them, they said, oh, it's not that important. I'll just wait until the next day to get my material. Um, we are looking to try to expand our delivery services and I'll talk more about that later. Um, that could be an option for uh, a little bit more for service delivery, but um, you know, even for those that we've offered it to, it, it hasn't been such a priority for those folks. Um, by and large, the response has been very positive and folks do understand um, when, they, when they do get a little bit more explanation about what, the, what it looks like behind the scenes. Um, Kim has kind of explained this and I love her analogy. We talk about this as a duck on water. On the surface, it looks really calm, but underneath we're working like crazy to keep this thing afloat. And that's kind of, that's a really good analogy. Isn't there a way to do more behind the scenes? Uh, just, a, just a video or just some type of communication to let the patrons know what it takes. Just an article as to what it takes to get your book. And, you know, in terms of how many are going per day, just do a, a one day infograph. Because I think it would be helpful for them to know what's involved. And I think that might, in terms of communication, to let them know exactly what's going on behind the scenes, because you've got perceptions that not a lot of work is being done, but I think that would be a good way to tell that. And then the other question I've got is, what have some of the other libraries done to reassure their staff that have gone opening, that have gone on and opened? What are some of the techniques? Because I'm sure they have similar profiles in terms of age. Maybe, maybe not, that's an assumption. Yeah, I can't speak to that that detail. Um, it, this this particular instance is pretty fresh, so um, you know I think obviously we're going to have to make some accommodations here and there. But you know we need to, we need to ensure that we're following all of our all of our protocols, which again um, we're we're masked up constantly and we're keeping our distance from one another. We're doing our best to work in teams. 
Um, we have our daily um, health screening that all employees need to do before they come into the building to verify that they do not have any symptoms and that they meet all the criteria to be able to be released to work. And, um, you know, so those are all the steps that we need to be following. And um, it's true. I mean, if one person were to fall off a team, it, it could be very impactful. We're a pretty lean unit mm -hmm. and we always have been. Um, and uh, this year we've experienced some shrinkage on our team as a result of some turnover. And we've had some, some important retirements as well. So uh, despite all those things, we are afloat, but it is, it's still a very sensitive operation to, to try to keep things at the level that they are at the moment. I have just a detailed question uh, for Kim. Are you, are you changing the information desks at all so people don't get right up on the person behind the desk? So we, um, we used to run with th uh, three staff members at the desk um, prior to November. One of the couple things that we did to kind of alleviate the, um, if you've been inside the library, when you come in, Mm -hmm. Patrons happen to usually stand right in front of the hot pick section to wait for a patron or wait for an open staff member. Uh, so we've kind of reshifted where the line goes. It kind of leads into the reference in reader services department. Mm -hmm. um, we put up a stanchion sort of sign there and we also remove the interior book drop that was right by one of the stations. So someone coming into the library, dropping books didn't interfere with someone checking out with another staff member. Mm -hmm. When we reopen, we'll look at um, adjusting where those book drops for the inside will be. And we will only have two staff members behind the information desk, one at mm -hmm. the ADA station and one in the middle. So that way patrons can socially distance. We've seen mm -hmm. families of four or five come in and they'll huddle by that station. So we wanna make sure that they're able to be safely distanced from the other person who's at the mm -hmm. ADA station. And then we'll have the signage specifying. And we don't see a lot of the um, uh, stepping behind the plexiglass. We see a lot of the pulling down of the masks to yeah. talk to mm -hmm. us because of the plexiglass. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's our biggest one that we see at the circulation desk is that mm -hmm. it's a conversation of, can you please pull your mask back up? <laughs> so I'm I hope that answers that. your question. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Thank you and welcome to Will Met. Uh, you. I know that you're going to be really great. You have already done some wonderful things. Thank you. I was I think I'm guilty of the last um, uh, of the last one, Kim. I found that I had to scream and because I wasn't maybe enunciating as well, I dropped my mask. So <laughs> um, but thank you so much for that. I, um, I really appreciate all the, all the background. And I don't know if you, it, while you were speaking, I don't know if um, any of you have been to Shack or Share in Wilmette. They are local, um, a family owned store and they have decided to um, mainly sell online because during the pandemic. And um, after a while they decided to open only certain days of the week. So I don't know if that might be something, I know you've probably thought it out, Anthony and, and Kim, but I, we miss the library, you know, um, less, I think in, to go around and browse for an hour, that's way more than I've ever, even since, you know, when it reopened in the summer, that's way more than I ever needed and, and used it for. But I did come in with my three kids, which probably can be, you know, uh, social, you know, it can, it can look and appear to staff that we're not socially distanced, but the kids picking out a book, we, we really miss it, you know, and I think we would spend maybe at the most 15 to 20 minutes there. I don't know if you'd consider maybe opening the, you know, having certain days that the library is open, continuing, you know, the online offering, you know, the online, the ability to hold online and check out online, but have, Tuesdays and Saturdays be open. I don't know if the staff would feel comfortable with that, with that level of, and visitation maybe reduced to 20 minutes rather than 50 or, or, or an hour. Is it 50 or an hour? That, that's just all I did. Um, I, I think my concern with, with that model would be that um, we would be clustering more people into a tighter time frame. 
Um, in fact, what we're, what we're planning to do when we do reopen is to expand hours on Saturday. Um, so we're currently open 10 to 6, Monday through Friday for service. Um, and uh, even, even in this kind of pseudo remote environment. Um, and then Saturdays we're open 10 to 3. three so yeah. We're looking to open till 5 p.m. on Saturdays as our first step up, um, upon reopening because we know from our survey last fall that folks wanted additional hours on Saturdays. So that'll pretty much get us back to our regular hours on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> So, I mean, I, I think if we were to if we were to further limit the number of days, honestly, I, I think that might that might make things even more challenging. Mm -hmm. um, so, at this point, I guess you know, based upon what you all have heard about what our current service model is, what our current circulation statistics are, uh, what our plans are for the future, and given the uh, environment that we are in. Um, do you have any further advice to the library uh, leadership about what we should do regarding reopening? Well, I do think that it's extremely important to give ourselves the time to see what can evolve with actual leadership going on in both vaccination distribution and a an effort to build a nationally coordinated plan on coping with the pandemic. We have not had either of those under any kind of reasonable control up to now. And in the next few weeks, I think you're going to begin to see movement in that direction. That brings us um, right up to February 1st. And I think a week or two beyond that as a target for opening would make a great deal of sense. Once we do reopen, I think it's important to spread the volume of traffic for people who want to come into the library over as many days as possible so that it doesn't get concentrated in any way that uh, makes things more difficult or more uncomfortable. So, you know, I really do think that in a very short period of time, we're going to see a complete change of leadership. And um, that's, that's important to keep in mind uh, as, as different information becomes available, we may be able to respond to this with a lot better knowledge of what, what's feasible and what isn't. And I disagree with Ron. I think the February 1st target, if there are no more, you know, if, if Illinois stays in phase two to go on and open it, because I think states right now are all doing their own thing and it's nice to think that things are going to change in two weeks but i would not work on that and i think you've got lots of precautions that you've taken in the past and you all are working on it now to make some more precautions so that's my thing so i think you've got some trustees with some different opinions so you might want to hear from them. or as you've done in the past you did it based on what the situation was and you used your own judgment because you never voted on it. So you've got a lot of different opinions to go with. Anyone else like to contribute to that? Uh, this is Joan. Um, hope I don't break, my uh, internet doesn't break up. I um, I tend to agree at the, or you know lean towards um, using your you know you all have the best judgment, but um, I I just think that um, you know pushback from the community is is um, always on our minds. Safety is always on our minds, and just meeting the you know meeting in the middle, and um, it's kind of neither here nor there perhaps, but I, I think that, um, I think getting open and, and particularly when patrons see local other libraries from Evanston or local communities, um, that's where I think the pushback comes from. And um, I, I don't mean to uh, say that we don't follow best practices and, and staff uh, safety is of uh, utmost, but um, I think I'm, feel at times very sensitive to what the community has to say, well, particularly when they see what's going on in neighboring communities. 
So I'm for, um, I guess I would say I'm for that February 1st or thereabouts and trying to move forward with that. Does anyone else have anything else they want to add before we move over to the library RFP project updates? Director Austin. Thanks, Kim. All right, thank Thanks you so me. much for discussing. We're gonna be on a, we're gonna target our, our February one and we'll keep you posted about our plans as we make progress towards that goal. Okay, um, so, this is a very busy time at the library beyond the pandemic. Um, we've got a lot of projects coming up within this year. So I wanted to give you an update on the work that we're doing there. So um, the RFID project, as you may recall, we um, have an agreement with Biblioteca to begin that project. And we are expecting our first delivery of the Biblioteca RFID equipment this week. Um, we were certainly hoping to receive our equipment before now. As you may recall, we um, entered into an agreement with Biblioteca um, in November. So um, un I understand that there were some supply chain issues that held up some parts that were part of the equipment that we had ordered. Um, and so that is what the delay has been. However, that project is going to be getting underway here shortly. So the methodology for this project is as follows. Um, as soon as the equipment starts to arrive, um, we're going to be installing um, the tagging equipment in the technical services department, which is where all of um, our materials begin their lives at the library. So that uh, at the point at which we're processing all new material, um, putting barcodes in them, um, getting the stickers on them and so on, that is the point at which we're going to start our tagging process. So all new material will get tagged. And once we are up and running and th that department is trained, we will then shift our training um, over to the circulation department and begin phase two, which is the tagging of all material that has been returned to the library. So the most popular materials, the items that have most recently circulated and are most likely to go back out into people's hands, we're gonna get those tagged next uh, before they go back on the shelves. And then phase three is the biggest phase of the whole system. And that is the in the stacks tagging. That's the deep part of the collection. Um, we're expecting to receive this week our first delivery, and that is of the, the tagging carts that are going to help with phase three. So, of course, you know, the stuff that I want last is the stuff that arrives first. Um, but anyway, the tagging carts are going to arrive. Um, and then these are our little mobile carts that are about the size of a book cart, a small desk. And they have a computer built into them as well as a scanner and a, a little printer that spits out the, uh, the RFID tag. And what's gonna happen is these carts are gonna travel around um, throughout the library. There's one for each floor of the collections and uh, we'll be tagging um, in the stacks as, as soon as we get the other phases of this project underway and the training completed. So um, we're still on target to complete this project um, before the summer. Uh, that is our goal. We think that once we get started in the stacks, it's probably going to take about three months to get through, um, you know, somewhere between 300 and 350,000 materials. Uh, the staff, as you know, continues to be um, uh, assessing our collection for condition and uh, to weed uh, the materials that are no longer needed and that, so that we're only installing tags in the items that we need most. So that's a project that is continuing as we speak. Um, so that's the, that's the RFID project, um, and I will keep you posted on any, any updates that we have about that as we move forward. Any questions about RFID? So in an effort to facilitate, um, oh, Lisa, yeah, go ahead. Question, do you have any delivery date for those self-check units, those self-checkout yeah. units, which will sort of minimize contact with staff? That was the idea. That's certainly what we were hoping to receive by now, but that is apparently the part that is coming from overseas uh, that is missing, uh, belongs in that equipment. So that is what we've been waiting on. And um, I don't have any update on that, on that information at this time, but I, I will be sure to let you all know when I do. Uh, we certainly want to get those uh, self-checkout stations installed and scattered throughout the library. That'll really help the, um, the compression that we have at the circulation desk. You may recall last year, we did purchase two Biblioteca self-checkout machines at the beginning of the pandemic before we even brokered an agreement with Biblioteca. And those two self-checkout stations um, are, one is in youth services currently. Uh, so there's two check checkout stations up there. And then we have one of the old ones um, still in its original location across from the circulation desk and one of the new Biblioteca stations 
is um, across from the recent arrivals area. We've recently um, put some data into the floor in front of the recent arrivals area where we're going to be relocating the open holds. And we're gonna, put, we're gonna probably relocate that self-checkout station, one of the newer ones, into that space to help facilitate checkout of the hold material. Uh, that's all gonna be part of the communications that will be going out here as soon as we can uh, regarding the new open holds model. So we'll get some pictures together and we'll help to illustrate it and walk folks through, through what the steps are um, for using that equipment um, here in the coming week. Um, any other questions about RFID? Okay, um, the next project is kind of in motion um, and we've received all of our bids and that is our audit services RFP. So through the month of November and early part of December, Finance Manager John Risco and I prepared um, a request for proposals for audit services. As you know, we've been with Sikich now for um, about 10 years or so, and it was time for us to reevaluate our audit services and to try to diversify and get some separate eyes on our finances. So we went out to bid and um, we received six uh, proposals from some great firms that are familiar with um, library districts and small government. And um, we have reviewed um, that information and we are ready to make a presentation to the finance committee. Um, uh, yesterday, I sent around a doodle poll to see what your availability is as uh, the finance committee and trustees to attend that meeting so that we can discuss um, the audit services proposal and our recommendation, as well as to explore the finance policy that we have in motion as well. So if you haven't already filled out that doodle poll of your availability, please do. And uh, we'd like to get that meeting on the books so that we can present this information to you. Um, we're, we're really satisfied with the response that we got. And I think we've got a good recommendation for you all, but I'm not gonna tell you now. All right, um, the next update is the, R, uh, the RFP for our website redesign. Um, so beginning um, in uh, November and December, uh, Digital Services Manager Stephen Koble and I were meeting to discuss the content um, for our, our website redesign process. Um, Stephen also um, got together with uh, our committee. We're working with a, a cross-departmental team that is um, currently evaluating our present website making recommendations for improvement. As you know, um, we've been relying an awful lot on our website this last year, and we've been able to discover a lot of what the weaknesses are as we've been pivoting. So we've got a long list of things that we know that we want for our new website and a lot of great sites that we can compare to so that our new consultants um, will have some guidelines uh, as they design the new site for us. We just posted uh, this RFP for the website redesign today on our website. And if you go to About Us, you can see um, a listing of all of the RFPs, including uh, past ones um, at About Us and then Request for Proposals. Uh, there are currently two open uh, projects that are listed there and uh, they are the website redesign that was posted today, as well as the first of two bid cycles for the 2021 Capital Repairs Project, which is gonna be set up in two different bid cycles. So um, before I move forward and talk more about the Capital Reserve project. Um, I was curious if you had any questions about the website redesign. Our goal is to present the uh, results of the website redesign um, and a recommendation for um, a firm that we can contract with at the March meeting. So we've got, we've, we've given a, a wide window for that response time. And then we're going to be obviously doing a review and interview of those candidates before we make that presentation to you in March. So stay tuned for more info on that one. I know you're working with the staff and you all are looking at different areas for the website. Are you doing any user experience in the interim before you work on that with patrons? Definitely. We plan to have a UX um, portion be uh, as part of the redesign process. We'll work in focus groups. Um, we have um, a number of, of what we call personas. So we set up, I think, between six and 10 individual um, types um, with specific type of information that they're looking for and behavior and how they would search the website. And we apply those personas. So those are, um, those are some mock environments that we can use in the meantime. And then when we're getting close to the testing phase, we'll be able to actually involve um, real, real patrons who can volunteer to help us with this process. Um, we, will, we will likely need to advertise this as we're still gonna be in the pandemic. In the good old days, we would just kind of 
sit up in in the lobby and invite people to come by and try the website in its you know in its temporary format. But um, we'll we, we will certainly be doing UX as a part of this and going forward. And in fact, one of the members of our our website committee has um, actually some educational background in leading uh, user experience design. So we're really excited to have his expertise on the team. That's John Amundsen in our adult services department. Sure. Um, all right, so anything else about the website before I move on to the capital stuff? Will the app stay the same or will there be any changes to the app based on the website change in terms of it mirroring some of the things at the website? Right, so um, the library does have an app. Um, the app's vendor is Communico and Communico is also the vendor for the library's um, web calendar. So when you book an event um, uh, at the library um, or you, you register to participate in one of our Zoom meetings, all of that is done through the Communico platform. That is also the platform that we use for doing um, a booking at parking lot pickup. Um, the Communico app is independent of the library's website. Uh, the Communico app um, you know, is, is already engineered to, as an app to, to display on a small device. One of the criteria of the new website is that it will have a responsive design, which means it will adapt to the size of the, de of the device that you are viewing it on. So we will, the, the website will maybe perform better and some people who are using the app currently may find that they wanna stay with the app or they may find that the website um, is more responsive on their device and they might shift back to using just the website. So um, yes, uh, that is responsiveness is definitely one of the criteria of that page. Okay, um, capital projects. All right, so um, you've got a lot of information in your packet about the capital projects, um, but I wanna give you a little bit of an overview. So when we met back in uh, August of last year with our consultant from Ingberg Anderson, Joe Huberty, he did a presentation about our capital reserve study. And at that time, we received a report and I included a portion of that report in the board packet and then also have referenced that to you in a number of, of separate emails that we've been talking about related to this project. Uh, that really set the stage for the work that we knew that needed to be done this year. So essentially what the capital reserve study did was it took a comprehensive um, roof to basement study of the entire building, uh, building envelope and all the contents of it for any fixed assets inside the building. So everything from the roof to the electrical system was evaluated, the conditions were assessed and recommendations were made based upon the, uh, the studies that we, that we conducted. Now, a number of issues were identified as um, systems that were wearing, um, that were already past their prime or were not in compliance with code. Those were the priority items that were identified back in August. And uh, there was an estimate that was set on those. And uh, there's a document in your packet that shows um, that this is in fact the busiest year for us in terms of catch up with a lot of our capital maintenance type projects. And that is in fact the work that we um, gave the go ahead for Joe and Shales McNutt, our construction management firm, uh, to put together a bid set for and to develop drawings uh, to complete all of this work for us this year. Um, so what we are looking at is um, a series of projects that range from the, the, uh, the top of the building, from the roof. Uh, this library has approximately 11 roofs, eight of which are in you know, wearing or poor condition and need to be updated. Um, I provided a document to you in your packet that talks a little bit more about the philosophy of the response that we're taking with regards to the roof because we did kind of oscillate in terms of terms, whether we were talking about replacement or repair. Um, at this time, I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth about this, but the, um, the conceptual idea that we have guiding this project is that we are, we are opting to repair the roof at this time to recoat the roof and not replace it. Um, this will renew the warranties that we have on the roofs and will get us at least another 10 years of life, if not more. We know that in 10 years time, we will also be reaching the sunset period for the, roof, uh, uh, the rooftop HVAC units, in, in particular the cooling towers and so on. Some pretty in, intense um, equipment that's on the roof that will need to be replaced. As I said in, in that report, um, if we wanted to replace the roof, we would need to hire a crane to take all of those units off the roof, to replace the roof, then put all that old equipment back on top of the roof. 
When I was talking about it with the consultants, I suggested that maybe we should just wait to replace the roof until we need to replace the rooftop units in any way, um, that there's an economy of scale in terms of the savings, and it seems that the timing would sync up. And that's what that document that's attached to, their, uh, to your report from Ingberg Anderson kind of explains the rationale behind all of that. So that's the roof. Um, we're also doing a complete building envelope tuck pointing. Now, this is the first time that we have done a comprehensive tuck pointing of the building in many years, I, probably within this century. Um, so um, that is gonna be a fairly involved process that will take um, probably at least 10 weeks to complete. Um, that also involves um, sealant uh, work. So we've already begun some of this process on the, the west curtain wall of the building when we were dealing with the water infiltration issue there. We've talked about that previously. Um, there's a lot of caulking work that needed to be updated around the building, and that's the sealant work that we're talking about here that's part of the scope. Um, we've already talked about the parking lot paver repair work, um, and that was a contract that we initiated um, um, in the middle of, of, uh, of last fall. Uh, that work is slated to begin uh, when the library is going to be closed in August. Um, so I'll get to that here in a little bit when I talk about the electrical detail. The water infiltration is a persistent issue at the library. So we addressed the curtain wall at the main entrance. Um, we, re we replaced um, the mullions there. Um, we, we cleaned out all the weeps. We infilled and replaced a lot of the, the caulking and made sure that that system is performing the way it was designed. Uh, so that work has been done. The lower level continues to be a persistent issue and we think we have finally discovered what the root cause of all the water issues are in the 640s. Um, so what we're, what we're proposing to do here is to, this is a very invasive project. Um, so this is in the 640s of the lower level, which is along the south um, portion of the building along Wilmette Avenue. So um, if, you, if you're standing on the, on the first floor of the building, for example, if you're in the teen room or in the fiction room, it's what's immediately below you, just to kind of give you a reference. So what we're gonna need to do in that area is we're gonna have to take the collections off the wall um, in order to pull the walls back, address, um, address the foundation. We're gonna have to put in um, a barrier in there um, between the drywall and the foundation to wick the water away from the building itself. And we're installing a drain tile system beneath this all to capture the water and to go into um, an existing uh, a drain tile uh, so, uh, a piping system that's underneath the building that goes out to the sewer. Um, so it'll, it'll go into the same roof drain system that we have from the top of the roof. All right, so this is gonna be a fairly involved process to complete. So approximately, I think, I, I can't remember the, the, the number off the top of my head, but hundreds of shelves of material will need to be removed from the wall. The walls will need to be removed from the wall. Um, we will then put, put that, uh, that's, um, that uh, um, I, I, Tyvek type system uh, against the concrete. We will tear away concrete from the floor and install the drain tile system. Then we'll replace the carpeting, put the walls back on, put the shelving back on, and put the, back, the books back on the shelves. This is gonna be a several week process and it is slated to begin in April after the thaw. The library will likely be open while this whole project goes on. In an effort to try to protect the collections during this whole process, we'll need to put masonite up against the other bookshelves that are not already impacted by this project. And then we'll put up a visqueen plastic barrier around all those stacks to protect the collections. But that will mean that browsing of these collections will not be available during that time when this project is going on. In fact, for safety purposes, we'll probably have to wall off a portion of this area and keep the public out of that space for safety. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the collections are gonna be completely out of um, availability to the public, but if you need those cookbooks, um, cause that's really the area that we're talking about, um, we, we may need to, uh, to, to find an alternate means to deliver those books to you and you may need to wait just a little bit longer to get them. That's probably one of the more impactful um, parts of this project that's gonna take place during open hours is this um, water issue on the lower level. The most invasive part of this whole project is the next item, and that relates to the updating and replacing of the electrical mains, feeders, 
and uh, the branch panels. This is a huge project. Um, currently, the, as we know um, from the uh, Capital Reserve study, our building is not up to code with the way that the electrical mains are divided. Uh, there is no single point of turnoff for the electrical. So in the event of a fire in the building, the fire department would not be able to easily um, disconnect the power to the building. Um, there are actually a couple ways in, um, in which the power still comes into the building um, that it would need to be cut off at. So what we're trying to do is to get us up to code and in a way that we can do that is by um, installing a system on the exterior of the building um, on the north side adjacent to where we're doing parking lot pickup. There will be a cabinet into which the electrical main will be fed off of the pole that's kind of adjacent to it. So if you're standing in the parking lot facing the building, um, you're, you're gonna see these power poles kind of in front of you and that's exactly the area that we're talking about. Um, so in order for us to do this, we're gonna have to cut the power to the building. This is the electrical main. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, is a, this is a massive undertaking. It is gonna take the, the building out of commission for approximately two weeks because of how invasive this is. Because we won't have any power to the building, we won't have any HVAC. We won't have any lights. Technically, we won't even have a server. Um, the phone system won't be operational. We're going to lose basically the operation of the building. Code will mandate that the building cannot be operational when there is no power to the building, but certainly in the middle of a pandemic with an HVAC system that's not running, it wouldn't be possible for us to operate. So realizing that this is the impact, um, our construction team and I have been coordinating a plan that will try to consolidate as much of the most impactful work of this project to coincide during the same two week period as this main shutdown. Um, I'm gonna get into the details of this a little bit more, but there are, there's a lot in the packet that I, I've kind of explained um, about what I think some of the conditions are related to this. Um, so related to this main replacement, there will be some rerouting of the conduit that goes into the basement. Uh, the, the, there will be one single turnoff for the electric, electricity in the building as there should be by code, but a number of our feeder panels or our branch panels rather around the building will also need to be updated and replaced. And that is gonna have kind of a rolling blackout kind of issue in certain parts of the building where HVAC units and lighting are gonna be affected. So mm -hmm. cumulatively, we're expecting at least two weeks of downtime uh, for the completion of this project, but there may be certain areas of the building that'll still be under construction when we finally do reopen. So just kind of to, to keep your, your head around um, what's happening with all of that. The parking lot paver replacement project that we've talked about previously will be taking place, that's a lot of P's there, um, will be, um, will take place concurrently uh, with this whole project. So. Um, we figured that since the building is going to be closed and the parking lot is, is a really impactful project anyway, we're just going to do those things concurrently. Um, so, but like I said, we've already, we've already talked about that. Concurrent with a lot of the electrical work is also going to be the replacement of our fire alarm system. The fire alarm system is also no longer up to code and because the square footage of the building that is being impacted by the work that we're doing um, it, will, it will be required to be updated as part of this project as well. Um, part of the code issue is that this is not an ADA accessible fire alarm system. It does not have um, an auditory uh, enunciator. Uh, so um, meaning there's no verbal command uh, for people to know what to do in the event of a fire or an emergency. So this new system will do that. Um, it will also have a generator backup, which this, this current one does not. It has a battery backup. So, um, so that's the fire alarm system. And then the last piece of all of this is an item that's been on our wish list for a long time. And that is the updating and replacement of our security system, as well as our access control system. Um, and all of that has electrical components and there's an economy of scale with all this electrical work. Uh, we're able to do all these things concurrently. So that is the scope. Um, you've got a timeline in your packet as well for how this is gonna work. The first project is gonna be going out for bid here. That's relating to the masonry work and the roof. Uh, that is gonna be going out to bid here beginning on Thursday. We made the announcement in the paper yesterday. It's on our website today. And um, the, the, the bidders will be able to, uh, to pick up the packets um, from our construction manager beginning on Thursday for those scopes. You will review um, that information with a rep from Shales McNutt at our February 16th meeting. 
Um, so that's the first phase that we're going to have, and you'll be getting a lot more information about this as we move forward. Uh, the second phase of this is all of the other work that we've discussed here, primarily all the electrical type work. And that is going to be in bid set two, which is slated to go out to bid in early February. And we will be reviewing um, the bids for that project beginning um, in, on March 16th at the March meeting. Um, the work itself upon, uh, upon award will begin likely in April. And it will begin with uh, the masonry work on the exterior and the roofing, and then some of the other small electrical work before we get into the basement and start working on the, um, uh, the water infiltration project. So before I go into much more, I've been rambling for a bit. I wanna give you all a chance to ask any questions that you have about the scopes um, and about where we're at on this process so far. And then I can talk a little bit more about the August closure and what our mitigation plans are for that. Anthony, this is Fina. Um, I um, really appreciate, um, I, I mean, Anthony, I don't even think you are, it doesn't even think, seem you're like reviewing a, a document. I, I can't, I think you said that all from, from just your knowledge and the time you've really, you know, spent in, in creating such comprehensive um, documents for us. And they were very um, easy to read, um, easy to understand. And, um, and I really appreciate that because this isn't my, I'm not experienced in a lot of this, um, you know, bidding and, and uh, especially the roof work. Uh, 11 roofs. I mean, I, I think it's 11 roofs. I'm, I just I really appreciate the, the, the understanding you have and the ability to relay it to us so, so well. Um, I, one thing I'm hearing, I'm, so, I'm in support of the capital work and uh, especially um, in light of all the, uh, what I'm hearing is that it's going to bring a lot of what we have out of code, um, you know, updated and into code. And that's a very important thing. Um, and I also, um, I also understand we have, I, I appreciate the pricing, um, the, the budget and um, the reserve fund that we have um, is certainly enough to cover um, the, the um, planned costs, the budgeted costs for this. So I'm in support of it and um, thanks again for your work. Mm -hmm. Second that. <laughs> Anthony, I have a question. Um, I don't see in either bid package one or two, the water infiltration work. Is that intended uh, to be included in what is described there or is that going to be handled separately? The water infiltration project on the lower level is part of the second bid set. Um, and I think the scope of that is still being developed. Um, so if, if I missed that notation in the information, I'm really sorry for that oversight, but that part will be bid out as part of the, the, the second set that's gonna be announced in February. Okay, because I, you know, that's, I have experience dealing with that problem. We put interior footing drains into our lower level um, several years ago, and it did indeed uh, solve those problems. Um, and so, you know, I think that is a good approach to handling it. Um, the one question that may be appropriate to consider is that um, what we did in addition to the uh, interior water collection system and the footing drains was that we also installed Volcoli panels uh, on the exterior of those same walls. And the question is whether that's something that ought to be evaluated. Um, it provides an additional level of protection. It's not 100%, but the two together are substantially um, uh, beneficial in trying to minimize the return of the problem. Because as you, as you may know, the, the truth is that water infiltration never stops. Uh, the water never goes away. Uh, and so the only way that you can do is the only things that you can do are to impede its flow and then to have a water catch system, which is what the footing drains do. Um, and so, um, you know, that's an additional element that, that 
would not add tremendously to the cost, but it's certainly worth evaluating with the engineers to see whether it would be beneficial. Um, you know, because that's a that's a problem which never fully goes away. Um, uh, I do have experience also with the roofing issues and the electrical. I write the licensure exams for the city of Chicago for those professions. And, um, and that work need, does need to be coordinated and, it, and grouping the bids in this way is, is certainly going to be beneficial um, to getting that work done. Um, the, um, you know, so I, I think this is, this is a good approach. Um, I, I think we can, you know, we can talk further about, you know, about the detail of how to manage the, the infiltration. And, and I didn't, as I said, I didn't see it in either package one or two. It yeah. may have just been omitted from the language that's there. Yeah, I, I misspoke a moment ago, Ron. It is in fact part of bid set one and it is considered part of the masonry because we are doing a, a bit of uh, concrete cutting. So um, they're, mm -hmm they're expecting to utilize the same team uh, on the lower level um, with that project. Uh, I don't have a lot of information that I can share with you about the actual um, uh, solution that has been proposed in terms of what, what you're saying. I think it is exactly as what you're describing though, Ron. Um, what um, what uh, Joe just des described this solution as a belt and suspenders type solution, which I would say is we're, we're, both, we're both capturing the water as well as wicking it. So mm -hmm. I, think, I think what we actually are proposing is along the lines of what you've described. And it is part of bid set one. Uh, Jason and or Joe will both be present at the, um, the meeting on, uh, on February 16th. And we can get into some detail then if you wanna talk a little bit more with them about um, what the solution is that we've proposed. Okay, I also write the masonry exams for Chicago. So you know, as I said, I have some experience both with the licensure of these professions and with the fact that we've had to address some of these same problems uh, in our residents. I'm not surprised you're an expert and, and spoken like someone who's been dealing with water infiltration at home too, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, um, any other questions or comments about the um, 2021 capital repair project? Yeah, they just want to say um, thank you also for bringing on uh, bringing to our attention Engbert Anderson because I think that has really helped a lot to figure out the, the most cost effective and efficient way for us to plan our capital planning for the next many you know five, ten, fifteen, twenty five years. So that's that's terrific, and I think that's a real uh, great addition to what how we can um, um, ensure the li protect the library and, and, and keep it in, in great shape. Thank you. And, I, and again, I want to thank you for your support um, as a board in um, allowing us to work with the firms that we've selected. Um, I continue to be really impressed with the work that they're providing for us. Um, I met with them again today to talk about some details of the scope. Um, it, it's, it's as if these guys work here. I mean, they care about this building as though it were their own, as if they were resident taxpayers. Um, it's wonderful having them on our side. They're, they're good thinkers. So thank you. Yeah, because yes, it seems like it's very cost effective how they have laid everything out, which is which is which is what we are all about. So okay. I mean this is this is a big deal. We got a lot going on here. So um, this is this is certainly a time that we can talk about it. But um, I mean we we'll, we're gonna get into a lot of the details and we're gonna be talking about this project for the next many months. So um, as soon as I have information and updates that I can share with you about the details, I'll provide that. Um, but, uh, for, for now, I think, um, that's kind of, it kind of is what it is until we, until we've got our, our, our contractors on board. So. Anthony, remind me if you did say that the schedule was on, um, the public website or is that going to be the yeah, we have schedule? I mean, there's a, there is a schedule that's in your packet. Um, and so that is on the website right now, but we're, we haven't even, we're not even really out to bid at the, at the moment. So um, until we've got the contractors in, until we know what their availability is, um, we really don't, we don't know the exact dates that things are gonna kick off. But again, tentatively April 1 is when we would quote unquote break ground on this project um, with substantial completion by the end of, of September is our, is our goal. 
Um, <clears throat> so this is probably an opportunity for me to talk about the most invasive part of the project. And that is um, the electrical panel, uh, the main feed replacement and the parking lot pavers. So in, in my um, spiel in the packet, you're gonna see that there's about a page or so that I've talked through a number of details related to this aspect of the project. Uh, this is gonna be the most impactful and this will require the closure of the building um, because of the electrical going down. Um, the parking lot alone would be pretty disruptive to not have access to the parking lot for two weeks. Um, the book drops are gonna be affected by this. Um, so um, over 80% of our returns currently go through those three book drops in the parking lot right now. Um, we're not gonna have access to those. So a couple steps that we're trying to, to address in an effort to try to meet the demand of our community at this time is to, is to survey a number of options. And I'm exploring a number of different ways that we might be able to provide service um, through the month of August. The last thing I wanna do on the tail end of this pandemic is to close the library again, especially when people are like, I'm vaccinated, everything seems to be fine. Yes, I'm still wearing a mask, but gee, you've been open, you haven't closed again. Why are you closing now? It's not something that I can see or feel or experience. Um, you know, it doesn't make immediate sense to me. So we've got a lot of communication that we're going to need to do about this to prepare the public for this project. Um, but we're also looking at some partnerships in an effort to try to provide services um, in that short time that we're going to be closed. I think I need to also um, draw your attention to the fact that we timed this portion of the project to go in August because August is typically the second quietest month of the year for the library after December. Our circulation is lower and our door counts are the lowest in August. Typically our community likes to go on vacation uh, right before school starts up again. And August is the month where that seems to take place. There's a possibility that a good number of folks in our community will have their vaccinations by then possibly and feel confident about traveling or maybe go to their summer homes and they may not even be in the community and might not even notice that the library was closed for a couple of weeks. Uh, however, we are doing whatever we can to prepare for this and to try to provide service in the interim. The first step that we can do is to look at our partner agencies and to see how they might be able to support us. So I've reached out to our neighboring libraries that share borders with us to see, can we encourage our patrons to come to your library during this time to pick up their holds, assuming that that is convenient and is in compliance with your local guidelines. So that is a step that we're working on right now is that kind of a partnership. The more expansive um, aspect of this would be for us to relocate the library for a period of a couple of weeks. Now, that's gonna be a pretty involved process and um, I'm not through exploring that option, but to me at this preliminary stage, it feels a little cost prohibitive. So what I'm looking at there um, at the moment are a number of options. There are two places that we can go. We can look to rent a space. We can find a vacant storefront somewhere in town we could temporarily relocate library services to this vacant storefront. We would need to do a number of things to that storefront, however, before we could use it as a library. We would be subject to, as it's going to be a public building, a number of codes and permitting um, that would require us to have certain facilities in place. If it is an empty shell of a building, it will need furnishings it will need to be equipped to serve as a library. So it will need desks and it will need shelves and, and sorts. It will also need techn technological and telecom infrastructure. So that would be some build up that would be necessary for us. We also are not going to also, we're not gonna have access to the building during this time frame. So any material or equipment that we bring over for this period of time, whether it's two weeks to a month is gonna to have to suffice in service to the community for that period of time. So if we brought books over, for example, we would only be able to use the books that we brought over because the access to the building would not be available during that time. That would all, however, serve as a place where we could receive returns and we could also distribute holds that come from other libraries through a space like that. So we would be able to sustain some level of services. It's a lot of coordination for a very short period of time, mm -hmm. um, but it's certainly doable. So that would be one aspect would be to find a vacant storefront. And there are a few, and I've talked about this already with the village manager, and I'm looking at some spaces all around town. Um, primarily targeting areas that are, um, you know, uh, might be a little bit cheaper for us to manage. Eden's Plaza would definitely be an area that I would love to consider because it would give us a presence on the west side of the community where we currently really don't have a presence. Um, however, we know that rents in that area are, are certainly more expensive. Um, 
we, we looked at the Joseph A. Bank building over here, um, just across the street from us here by the train tracks. Um, however, we know that parking in that space may not be adequate for us in the meantime. I won't mm -hmm. get into a lot of details about logistics, but there are a number of ways that we're approaching this. Another angle that we could take beyond renting a space would be to see, is there a partner agency that might be able to lend us some space in one of their facilities? So I've begun that discussion with the park district as well. I don't have any more information to share with you at this time about this, but this is an open conversation and I'm continuing, continuing to explore it for you. So I wanted to get your feel. If the library were to be closed for two weeks in the month of August this year, what concerns that would you have that you would want me to consider to ensure that we were providing reasonable service to our community during that time frame? A model that we could certainly use would be to, if we just close the library, would be to encourage uh, the public to come in, especially during the couple weeks before we close and stock up, <laughs> mm -hmm. kind of like they did um, last March before we closed the library. Um, we intend, I, this is a piece and I'm sorry, I'm all over the place here. I asked you a question and I started talking again. But I wanna make sure you understand this detail. We are going to try to bypass the electrical uh, main feed during this two week closure so that we can keep the server room powered. We're gonna bring in an air conditioning unit to keep it cool. And we're gonna keep the server up as part of this. We were exploring trying to expand the, the generator that just wasn't the right project at this time. We'll talk about the generator later. Um, but we will try to power the server. So we'll at least have the ability to do all the remote services that we're continuing to do today um, during August. Um, staff will still have the ability to respond to email and to have access to all their, their resources digitally. Um, but uh, the phones at this point are still um, up in the air. I'm not certain if the phones are gonna be able to be answered, but at least we would have those remote services. So what do you think we should be providing to the public during the two weeks that we're gonna be closed? Um, what should our priorities be? And what do you think I should be considering? Mm. Well, maybe advanced warning for sure. And uh, perhaps hiring a couple of counselors to send out <laughs> I think public information ahead of when any of these um, interruptions of service or significant changes in service would occur is critical. And we might even um, find it helpful to engage um, some public relations support uh, specifically aimed at uh, how to cope with a service interruption and, and making sure that um, patrons are well informed about whatever options that we are pursuing. Um, uh, that information uh, would then be available to put up on the website as well so that people who were looking for library services would know whatever it is we determine is feasible and exactly how we're handling it. Also, there will be a need for an explanation um, of what we're doing to the building that makes it necessary to take such radical steps. Um, because I think most people will be understanding once they have the information but that's a lot of information or a lot of work that's going on in a short period of time. I think there will be, be uh, once it's understood, there will be appreciation of the coordination that's going into it so that we minimize the cumulative impact of these major changes. Um, but the reality is that people you know, need to have that information in order to know what's going on. They need to have the ability to plan to accommodate to whatever changes we're, we're talking about. I think it's too soon to make any judgments uh, or recommendations about alternate space. Um, we'll need more information about what those options are and what the costs are. But the bottom line is to make sure that we are well prepared to inform people both before and during um, the, this period of time 
uh, so that there is a clear understanding and easy availability to the information. And uh, building on Ron's point, um, if I may add to that, if I'm not muted, I'm not muted. Um, the, uh, as anybody knows, and Ron can speak to this, I know a lot as well, in terms of construction, there's no guarantee that our target dates become the dates that we actually end up closing. Um, the good news, if there is such a thing about COVID and how it's impacted the library is we have gotten very good at having a message to the community and beyond when we're open, when we're closed, what our procedures are. And I think if you haven't already done this, Anthony, to kind of do an assessment at some point in the next month or so over what's working well with messaging, where we might have missed a place to message so that when we do have more uh, concrete information, we can inform the public about the library not being available physically. Uh, and if there are alternative places you have found that, that make economic and, and operational sense. Um, my sense from what you've said is it may, there may not be an operational or financial place to do this, a financially sound place to do it. But again, also because of COVID, if we get the messaging out the right way, I do believe that people will, will have patience because they'll have lived through what they're going through now with their interaction with the library. Anthony, um, I remember that in the 90s, we had a really big, I think it was when the, um, you know, the addition, the second and third floor addition um, occurred, and there was a trailer next to the library set up um, for some of the materials that were, you know, more, you know, more readily, you know, necessary, and then I think a lot went to storage. Um, I asked about the schedule um, because I think it's best, and I know it's on, you know, our minutes, I'm sorry, on our agenda documents on the website, but um, I think it's really important to get that proposed schedule on, you know, our, our main, our main website, our main, um, I think the more notice we give folks, the better, um, especially since we know now. Since our board knows now and you know now, know now that, it, you know, we might not know the exact dates, but we know April to possibly August, this would occur. I would also try to partner with some of the village, um, you know, information resources that they have, messaging resources that they have. They, maybe they can also post our information on the village website, on the Wilmot um, Recreation Center website. Um, a lot of those facilities like aren't being used too. It, maybe we'd have some ability to use. I, I mean, I'm just this is kind of being creative, but Centennial has a lot of space that's not being used now. Um, the the recreation center has space that's not being used now. So maybe some of those altern the programming or something, some of those alternative things that maybe can't come be on site can happen there. Um, public spaces were used over the summer last year. Um, for I, we really liked the Wilmette, um, the, those like riddle walks. They were the parks that were at the, I'm sorry, the riddle walks that were at the parks. Um, sometimes those types of things can be used or parks can be used too. So I'm sure you've talked about this, but getting the schedule on, on the main part of the website rather than in, you know, the documents of the board, I think would be most, most beneficial to the public. Well, that speaks to what Stuart suggested, that um, communication is key. Um, I kind of like Fina's idea about a uh, trailer. And growing up, I remember bookmobiles were, um, you know, my source of my library. I don't even know if they have those anymore. But I'm wondering, I just think the storefront seems so much work and cost prohibitive. Um, are bookmobiles ever used anymore or is, or is that a thing of the past? But, um, and I certainly like partnering hopefully with the uh, sister libraries. I think that's, I guess I just feel like it's only for two weeks. And as you say, I feel like we're really going, you know, so um, we want the best of service, but it, hopefully it's only two weeks. And if we have a clear, um, message of what we're doing prior to, to everyone's point and partnering with the li the local libraries, um, I think we've done our best we can. And it's for safety. I mean, again, that I think is first and foremost, uh, it's patron safety. That to me is, is, has to be a strong message. 
I think there is something to keep in mind. Um, first, we won't know the dates until the contracts are awarded. Secondly, these are the optimistic forecasts at this stage. Um, it's estimated two weeks at this point, but it may actually become longer. For example, if the weather is bad and they can't do the parking where a parking lot work for a period of several days. Those are things that we have to anticipate could occur and be prepared for it. Um, bookmobiles do exist, but that's a very expensive option and nobody rents out a bookmobile. So, um, you know, the, 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 that's a challenge. It might be easier to manage uh, an alternate space than a bookmobile. Um, but I think, the, I think the main issue though is we need, we need to communicate um, when we have made enough progress on awarding contracts that we have some input from the contractors about what is feasible for them. Um, I would be very careful about putting out dates until we have a, um, a better forecast on what they're going to be. And I don't mean specific dates, but I, I think really, I think it's important to just put a range of, of, of a time frame. We're already planning this. We, we know as a board and it's on, I mean, it's not like it's, it's not able to be changed or specified closer to the time frame. I I really believe that if we know the time frame and that this is the capital, uh, the capital uh, projects are going to be going on, we we should let the public know as soon as possible and let the village know as soon as possible. Right, and we can and Vina and, and everybody else, we can do kind of a, a, a general message that says late summer at this point for when the library will physically be closed. Because as we've all, as we all have been discussing, we don't know the actual dates. We know the target dates. It will be closed. As part of that, I assume Anthony, this is a question. I assume uh, the answer um, is we can, can we expand someone's checkout time frame so that again, if we know it's going to be August and maybe the the earliest it might be is August thirteenth that we close that we can message for the month prior that people will have four or six or seven weeks to before they would, you know, that they can have that longer period of time to uh, to have an item out. So that that's another way the live people can plan for if our messaging is in the right place um, to anticipate uh, not having physical access to the library and its materials. Yep, definitely. I'm, I'm thinking that because the book drops won't be available. We won't be able to accept the return of materials. No, I'm, I'm talking about holding stuff, getting, checking stuff out and holding out longer, you know, yeah, but yes. And, and remind patrons that there are no late fees. I think that's important too. I don't know, yeah. I know we've been doing our best, but that all goes, that messaging goes hand in hand. But I think Director Austin had already, I think, outlined in terms of as one of the suggestions, the expansion. But I think when the first phase, I wouldn't start putting the timing of all the things that are going on until we get ready to start first phase, because I think people pay attention to what's most immediate and then show what's out different. And then maybe we could have some Zoom meetings to just briefly to do just a PowerPoint or whatever to show what's there and get their reactions to explain it to those that want to come, since I don't think we'll be able in the spring to be doing open meetings. I don't know. Yeah, probably not. maybe. But yes, I think we could very much offer the, um, you know, sessions public. like that to explain the scope of the work and, and what mm -hmm. the impacts are going to be and so on. Definitely. Um, in terms of, of everything that we've talked about here this evening, I think, you know, our first priority in terms of communications right now is to talk about reopening. Um, and I really don't want to get, you know, I don't want to get the public messaging, I mean, uh, about this project um, to, to cluster around what we're trying to talk about with reopening. I think that's my mm -hmm. first priority. So let's focus on that for the next couple of weeks. And then we can put, get some general information, create a website that's dedicated to this project and get some of that project information out there um, so that it's published and uh, start preparing people for it. Um, I, I agree, we need to get the messaging out there early and mm -hmm. uh, get folks prepared for it and to let them know um, how we're gonna be delivering on their investment in the library building. Very good. 
All right. Anything else that you wanted to talk about about the capital projects before I have an abbreviated director's report? <laughs> All right. Um, then I will make that transition into my report. Um, okay. So this is our first meeting as a board since um, we received word that Library Journal has awarded Wilmette Public Library its second five-star rating. Um, last year, um, 2019 was our first five-star rating. And before that, we had our very first star rating in 2018 mm -hmm. of three stars. Um, ratings are really, you know, just an opinion, um, but they're based in some pretty interesting metrics and facts. Um, mm -hmm. I always thought we were a five-star library, but um, getting accolades from, uh, from the leading library journal sure is, uh, sure is a feather in our cap. Um, mm -hmm. It really, the credit goes to our community, of course, and um, there's an article that the Trib wrote about our five-star rating that's included in at the end of my uh, report. Uh, but basically, um, what, what this is, is a measure of our success with the community. Our community is highly engaged and really values the services that we provide. Um, it is true. We are a reading community. We said that earlier. Um, our patrons um, have one of the highest per capita cir circulations in the country. Um, and particularly for digital resources. And that has never been more true than it is during this pandemic. In fact, just this last, um, this last quarter, um, some of our platforms, including Canopy, um, tripled in usage. Um, they're still not ready to take over all of our print circulation, um, but our community is highly engaged and they're early pioneers on all of our digital resources. So um, in preparation uh, this, this past year for knowing that we we're gonna be through the pandemic, you know when you approve the budget that we did allocate more to our digital resources and we mm -hmm. continue to, to invest in those and to make them available. So I wanted to, to make sure that I shared that detail with you. Um, I did mention earlier that our, our print circulation is up 2%. Um, I don't have metrics like that for my neighbors to compare, but I'm going to tell you, I think that's unusual. Um, when I was telling people earlier this summer that our circulation was down just like seven and 8% from where it was the year before, I saw a lot of jaws drop on those Zoom calls with my director peers, like how on earth were you able to sustain that? Um, but to see it reverse and, or to rather to, to, you know, to go forward and to be greater than it was the year prior, I think is, is really substantial and is certainly a credit to the staff, but definitely a credit to our community and their uh, value for Wilmette Public Library. Um, so a couple details I want to share from my report. Um, you'll see that um, we've got a new landing page for youth services. Um, we're experimenting with a few tweaks to our website in advance of the, the website renovation and creating a dedicated space uh, for families to go to get all their resources in a single spot. Um, has gotten pretty good feedback since we've launched it. So that may be a model that we want to use going forward with uh, the new website. So check that out. Um, on the front page of the website right now, you'll also see some highlights of a few other details that are going on. Uh, Winter Reading Club is in full swing. And uh, we've got some great prizes um, again this time around for finishers sponsored by the Friends of the Library um, uh, with gift certificates to the bookstall. Um, we uh, have resumed our take and make crafts again this, uh, this session, and we're also doing 3D printing. Um, and speaking of printing, Digital Services is also offering uh, remote printing for the public. So you can send your print jobs to the Digital Services staff, and uh, they'll print out stuff for you. So if you don't have a printer at home, um, we can certainly um, provide that service for you. Um, we're also, as we're here in the new year, um, we're starting get, to get tax form requests. And um, we are also printing tax forms for folks. So let us know if we can help you with that. Um, as you see in our, our programming report, um, we got a lot going on with programming and we've got an awful lot more on deck. Um, it's really exciting. Um, our usual year end um, programs were popular as ever. Um, really remarkable to think that our musical programs um, still are drawing hundreds of attendees and they are. Um, so our New Year's Eve Eve concert was um, hugely successful, as was one of our other jazz trio concerts that we had um, this past winter. So um, <clears throat> it's, it's great that folks are still finding opportunities to engage, even though they're not able to meet inside the library. Um, so as I said earlier, we've got a lot of interlibrary programming that we've been doing. That commenced with a project to participate in hosting Dr. Ibram X. Kendi last fall in November. 
And uh, that was a project that was spearheaded through the Highland Park Library. Yesterday, I met with a group of directors who were who all um, engaged on that project and went together to host um, Dr. Kendi. Um, we've, we're doing a number of other projects and we're trying to define the scope of how we're going to do that type of work going forward. It's worked really well during the pandemic, but we're not sure how sustainable this is going to be. We mm -hmm. certainly didn't budget for these types of projects um, when we set out this year. Um, so some of those are, are uh, speakers are really expensive and would have been cost prohibitive for us to host individually, which is why we were able to get um, a Zoom license and an agreement with the author so that we could um, have many more participants. So mm -hmm. the Kendi event, for example, that was right before our board meeting in November, that had almost 6,000 people attending. Um, we never would have been able to accomplish something like that here, certainly in person, much less um, digitally on our own. We wouldn't have been able to afford him. Um, but uh, in any event, um, we're looking to do more programs like that. Um, our bent has been typically on EDI initiatives. So um, that's um, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So we've got two other programs that are in the works that fall into that category. And that is our long shadow documentary screening um, and director Q&A that's gonna be coming up at the end of February on February 23rd. We'll have more information for that uh, um, for you soon about that. And we're also gonna be hosting a fireside chat again with Natalie Moore, who's hosting e-viewing on March 1st. So we're really excited about that event. We've also got another exciting author event um, that we're gonna be hosting soon that that's gonna be part of the same partnership project, but that's not quite ready for announcement. Um, but what is ready for announcement tonight is we have a uh, title and author selected for um, our One Book Everyone Reads series uh, that's gonna be coming up. Um, I, don't have a, I don't have a date at the moment. Oh yeah, I do, hold on one second. All right, April 17th, we are going to be hosting Charles Yu. Charles Yu is the author of the National Book Award winning uh, title, Interior Chinatown, which is gonna be our selection for this year's One Book Everyone Reads. Expect more information about that here soon. Um, it is on your agenda and we're gonna be um, certainly promoting that far more uh, as we move forward. Again, this is an event that is annually hosted by the Friends of the Library and is one of our um, most popular events. Um, oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Jill. Um, I've, I've just been updated that in fact, it is April 14th, not April 17th, but we got plenty of time to get that right before that time. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, what else do I have here for you? Ooh, ooh, another author event that we're really excited about. We've got so many author events. We've never had so many. It's exciting. Uh, this, this virtual environment actually is making it a lot easier for us to connect with folks with this type of programming. Um, so on February 18th, just a couple days after our next board meeting, we're going to be hosting author Catherine Grace Katz, and she's going to be discussing her work, Daughters of Yalta. Uh, we've got a website that's set up for this right now. It's on the front page of our, of our website. Um, do check it out. We're expecting that to be um, a really engaging uh, program as well. Um, a couple other details I wanted to share with you um, is because there's a financial impact to one of these. We did cut over to a no phone system provider here in December. Um, we are now on Comcast Business Voice for our uh, our phone service. We were previously with Call One. Call One notified us that they were going to double our rate. And we said, no, we're not doing that. Um, so with a lot of coordination with IT manager, Fred Wallace, we were able to um, get this, uh, uh, this project ported over with very little impact. And uh, so we're now on Comcast, uh, but there is going to be a little bit of a double bill there for a while. So you're gonna see that double bill from, from uh, call one probably on next, one's, next month's bills. So just FYI, if it looks like we're spending a little bit more on telephones, that's the reason is that transition period. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is um, late last year, we did publish, as I mentioned at our last board meeting, our year in review. Uh, this is our new model for our annual report, and, um, and that's been receiving a lot of likes and comments from our patrons as we've been promoting that around. Uh, that's where I'm going to pause my, um, my review of my report. Uh, we're just past 8 o'clock. You've been very generous with your time with me this evening. Um, is there any questions or comments on my report or anything else that I can provide background for?
All right, Madam President, would you like to take it from here? Um, you're muted, Lisa. Oh, the, oh, unmute, but yeah. Okay, at this point in time, Trustee Barshish, do you have anything regarding the ILA that you'd like to report? No, nothing at this point. Okay, and Director Austin, Rails, any updates? Um, nothing substantive to share at this point. Okay. Um, as I mentioned at the top of all of this, um, Rails is trying to advocate for the vaccinations for us. Um, but that's that's all I got. Okay. And there's no commute in terms of information items, there's no communication to circulate. Uh, President's Day legislative meeting, it's February 15th. You've got let um, Anthony know if you want to attend. It's going to be virtual. For, so for the first time, uh, you don't have to get up on that day. And it's always snowing, generally. <laughs> and you can just go and look, roll over and look at it virtually. And it's a good chance to see all the people who support libraries, because that tends who they, they tend to show up. Is there a deadline when you want them to let you know, Anthony, as to when, if they're going? It's February 15th. I would say by, by February 1, so by the end of this month, if at all possible. Um, it's a great opportunity. I think they're looking for ways so that you can also have breakout rooms to network with your peer trustees. It's also a great way historically for you to, to touch base with folks who are also um, elected officials. It's one of my favorite events. Um, so I, I really encourage you all to, to take a look at it. Um, ILA is still developing more details about this, but um, yeah, let me know by the end of the month if you're interested in attending. Okay. And uh, the three seats, and you all can read it. I don't need to go over it. There are three seats on the seven member WPL board that are open and there are six candidates with two incumbents. And that election is in April, April 6th. So, and then finally, uh, you've already gone over uh, one book everybody reads. Is there any new business? Oh, bis is there any new business? Uh, and I mess this up all the time. I'm, I'm on the committee with the village representing the library who will be doing some programming with the village in, in a year and a half will be uh, celebrating their CESA Quintennial. So it's just in the early stages, but where I see the library's role is basically talking about the past, the present, and also looking at the future. And it may fit in well with our strategic plan as to how we might best work with other units of government. Mm -hmm. And it's mainly a lot of the village past board members, and you've got someone from the park district and uh, someone from Chamber of Commerce. So I think it's sort of slowly growing. But I know Director Austin will be using his staff to help do programming in conjunction with it. And I think it may be a good opportunity because one of the things in our past strategic plan, plan and what we're also looking forward to is looking at dialogue, you know, in terms of having uh, community members come and talk about different issues. And I think the past is interesting, present is, but the future is also. And so I'll report when there's more to say, but right now it was just an introductory meeting. And they had not invited the school district, but they will be. Okay. Any other new business? Old business? Is anybody? Is there a motion to adjourn? I will motion to adjourn this very well run meeting and contribute to contributions from all trustees. Um, and by, okay. by Anthony as well, so well. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, Trustee Wolf has moved. Trustee Fishman has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? We'll see you tomorrow. And the meeting's been adjourned at 8.09 p.m. Have a good night, everybody. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.